four people, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, we uh, have a very action-packed uh, special event today, so I want to make sure we make most use of the time. My name is Chris Miano, and I'm the founder of Memory Fox. And um, first off, I want to thank everyone for being here and thank our esteemed panelists for taking the time to share their insights. And of course, I want to make sure I thank our fantastic marketing director, Carly Euler, on putting this all together. Um, I'm going to do some very limited table setting in terms of introductions, and then we're going to go ahead and write, get right into it. Um, the plan here is to take about 55 minutes for speakers. And for those who are interested, I'm just going to do a very small two-minute demo of Memory Fox afterwards and see how it can elevate the voices of your community. Um, but in no particular order, we have Maria Bryan, founder of Maria Bryan Creative and director of storytelling at Rustic Roots. We have Diana Farias Heinrich, I hope I did that right, founder Hi. of Habra Marketing. And we have Calliope Glaros, founder of Philanthropy Without Borders. And finally, we have Michael Cass, founder of Story and Spirit. So again, thank you everyone in the audience for submitting your questions. The panel had a lot of great thought-provoking content to wade through, and I think you'll really enjoy the answers. Um, we're going to share this recording publicly, and I'm going to wrap this all up into some really great articles that we're going to trip out throughout the year, culminating in an ebook to help crystallize a lot of our findings. Um, Carly is going to send out a survey right afterwards to get your thoughts on a lot of these questions, because most of you are all on the front lines of the, where this conversation really matters most, and I'm sure you have a lot of great insights. And uh, we'll include that in a lot of the content that we create um, and share your, your insights as well. Um, so, and I think I, everyone would agree on this. Ethical storytelling is a living, breathing conversation that needs to happen now more than ever in this vast black hole of an attention economy that everyone here has to deal with. And we hope to help support that conversation moving forward. So without further ado, let's get to that first question. All right. So the first question is for Maria. And this is more of a general question. Um, a lot of people comment, and of course, anybody else can contribute on this one as well. A lot of people commented they like the questions in the event description. So let's kick it off with this one. What do I have to do if the people we serve have sensitive stories that they might not want to share? What should I keep in mind? And what are some of the best practices that you would recommend? And this is for Maria, but um, certainly everyone else can chime in as well. So I love this question so much. Also, I'm so grateful to be in this space. So thank you, Memory Fox, for hosting this. The, the last thing I want is for folks here to feel like storytelling can be so harmful that we need to throw it out with the bathwater. So let's talk about how we can make it work when we are serving very vulnerable populations. And one of my favorite things to do are composite stories. Composite stories is you see patterns for the people that you serve, you see certain transformations, certain journeys that they have, and you create a story based on that and you can narrate it. Um, there are a few, and I, I've given some examples, we'll give some examples towards the end, some links of really great composite stories that I've seen. And a really good composite story means that if the story echoes maybe your neighbor or your, your friend, you wouldn't even be able to tell. Like there shouldn't be any identifying information, but you still get a sense of what the general transformation story is um, for the people that you serve. Also, my hope for a trauma-informed storytelling future is that we feel less pressure to tell hundreds of stories a year of our clients I really hope that we can start thinking outside the box. There are our founder stories, our staff stories, our volunteer and donor stories. So make sure that you are diversifying the kind of stories that you tell in order to honor, respect, and most importantly, protect the your clients or beneficiaries that may have a very, very sensitive background. That's great. Anybody else have any uh, anything to add to that? I think it's a, we're going to hit these questions a lot more in detail, but certainly at this high level, if any of you have any any additional insights. And I might just add that always keeping in mind the implicit power dynamics when we're asking clients for their stories, because you might get a quick yes, 
but that may come out of either a fear that services will be withdrawn or some sort of expectation of reciprocity, right? And so just because like, if I were to ask Chris, hey, Chris, would you be willing to tell me the story of the worst thing that ever happened to you so we can raise money? You might say, yeah, sure. Yeah. But underneath that is a feeling of coercion. And so just to add to what Maria was saying, always keeping in mind that we wanna to move towards greater belonging and relationality in our storytelling and away from anything transactional, right? And that idea of composite stories and kind of widening the universe of stories that we tell, I think it can be really, really powerful. Can I just add one thing? Cause I love that so much, Michael, that kind of the science behind trauma is that we know that there's the fight flight, um, and fawn response, I'm missing one, fight, flight. Freeze. Mm -hmm. So, and freeze. So fawn yeah. is the only one that's not behavioral, it's wanting to appease and please. So actually saying yes right away might actually be a trauma response that your clients and beneficiaries have. So make sure that they're not just saying yes, but it's just like abundant, excited, enthusiastic. They've had time um, to to maybe heal. So I so appreciate you you saying that, Michael. I absolutely agree. And one thing I would like to add too, um, in approaching people who may not want to share a story is one thing that always practically worked for me was to go through the gatekeepers, those being the case managers or the direct service staff and asking them who among your clients is ready to tell their story because they're the ones that are gonna have a pulse on where in the trauma cycle, you know, one of their clients might be and someone who might already be ready and willing to share. So I like to go that avenue first before even approaching a client to share a story. That really gets at what Michael was saying about power dynamics too, being very thoughtful about who invites someone to share the story and when and how. And if there's a way to um, have people opt in uh, as opposed to being invited or in addition to being invited, it makes sense in some organizations, it's, it doesn't in others, but um, that can also be a way of um, getting at those power dynamics. So people have a chance to sort of self-select and opt in as opposed to the pressure to say yes when being invited. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I add a quick thing to that? Because it just sparked. Absolutely. This is fun, Chris. Thanks for bringing us together. Yeah, I never get the great. chance to geek out on this. this um, right, that idea of making it an opt-in, something that can be really challenging and also really powerful on lots of levels is crafting a, a culture where storytelling is endemic. In other words, it's not just something that we do when it's time to get a communications piece or a fundraising piece, but it's part of the like living, breathing culture of the organization at every level. Right. That way, when we're asking for stories, it's not like it's fundraising time. Who's excited to tell their story? It's just a natural outgrowth of what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. I, I think was it Network for Good a couple of years ago? They did something, a study with that, and they found that the number one their number one recommendation was make storytelling, a, make a, like a part of your culture yep. as an mm -hmm. organization, elevating people's stories. Um, Dan, I think you had something else. Yeah, uh, definitely. I would second what Michael is saying and making it part of the culture is that everybody's involved. So one of the ways to do that practically is to have a schedule. Um, like Maria was saying earlier, right? Slow down. You don't need to produce a whole lot of stories, but if you have a schedule and everybody knows what to expect ahead of time, they're already have that in the back of their minds where it's like, okay, my turn to find a client's story is coming up, right? And like what I would always do is again, work through work through the direct service staff because they're going to know their clients best. Um, and then from there, you know, approach a client to, to share their story. Oh, that's great. And relying on those frontline workers, a lot of lessons there. Um, Kelly Opie, this one is for you. This is from um, Pamela and Laura. So how do you tell compelling stories about disadvantaged populations that are receiving services without being exploitative or contributing to stereotyping of that population. For example, one of my clients is struggling with telling stories about the under-resourced children her camp serves without making the children feel like somehow they are somehow less than. Yeah, it's a, that's a beautiful question. It's a, yeah. it's a really good example, Chris, thanks. I, I think the framework that works best in this case, it actually comes from the work of Trabion Shorters. I don't know if you know who he is, but he was um, the the person who um, coined asset and deficit-based framing. And I think it's actually important to describe what those are because um, 
they get sort of thrown out in our sector. And some people think of it as, oh, shifting the narrative from negative stories that talk about trauma and harm and challenges to like positive stories that talk about, you know, hope and and joyful things. And um, that's not quite what it is. I think that um, I wouldn't just recommend that we look um, at shifting everything to positive stories. I think, um, you know, as Maria talked about, previously, you know, some of us are working with clients who are experiencing, you know, the worst moment in their lives, right? And if we try to just slap a silver lining on everything, we run the risk of really minimizing their authentic experience and also minimizing some of the large systemic inequities that we're contending with. Um, and so it's not just about let's let's put a positive spin on this. Asset-based framing really looks at what are the aspirations and contributions of the person you're telling the story about. That's the important distinction. We're not just looking for the silver lining or the positive spin. Everyone, even small children, um, have aspirations, what they want to achieve, and they have contributions, things they've already done. And so um, with the example of, of kids in the camp, you know, I might be asking them questions if I'm doing an interview to get a story. You know, what has this child already you know, learned at camp that they wouldn't have learned in any other way? You know, what did they do for the first time at camp? What were their proudest moments? Um, those are the kinds of questions I might bring into an interview, not looking at the specifics of tell me about, you know, how under-resourced your family was or things like that. I wouldn't um, go into those kinds of details with a child. I would focus um, on their aspirations and their contributions. And we can still talk about the challenges, but we can do that in a more holistic way. So Maria brought up the composite examples, um, but we can talk about challenges, you know, in an aggregate way that doesn't um, necessarily, you know, pinpoint or blame anyone's family uh, or, or get at anyone's specific circumstance, right? Why does this camp need to exist? Um, there are there are macro reasons at play, right? Lack of access to school funding means kids don't go on field trips in the outdoors. Um, a lot of outdoor locations are only accessible, you know, by car. And so families that rely on public transportation can't access those. We know what those barriers are. We can talk about those in aggregate without having to get into the details of a child's particular circumstance. And we can focus the child's story on their aspirations and contributions. And I'd love to hear from others if, if you have other ideas or things to add to that. Yeah, this is a very rich question. Uh, um, lift up something that you said, because I think it's so key, is like focusing on specific moments instead of these like grand stories of transformational change is such a huge part of that. And also recognizing, right, that the nature of somebody's challenge is the least interesting thing about them, the least interesting. And so finding the things that light them up is going to um, make for a really powerful story. The, the other thing I'd add is um, when we lead with a deficit, it creates what's called a cognitive anchor, right? Which means it doesn't matter what happens next. The first thing I know about you is the trauma that you've been through. And so then it doesn't matter how many awards you win, how many degrees you get, you're always going to be defined in my mind because it's the way brains work by that deficit. So just to to add to what was said, um, this isn't just like good practice, it's it's pivotal for any kind of social change. Yeah, that's really nice. That's, that, that's excellent. Okay, uh, we'll get on to the third question. This is from Michael, Diana, and, and it's certainly of course, anybody else who wants, wants to chime in. This is from Lauren and Jody. Um, let's talk about consent. This question has three aspects. Should people sign a physical agreement before sharing their story um, versus agreeing via email or a call or something that isn't recorded? Um, how can we ensure our agreements inform and protect everyone involved? And finally, what special considerations do we need to take for children? Cool. Um, so I, I'll answer I like this question because for me, it's one of the few like concrete answers that can be given in this space. Should <laughs> um, people sign a physical agreement? Yes. Yeah. Any anytime you're sharing. And the reason isn't because it's, I, I don't think it's be, because it's important to have something signed, but because that agreement is kind of the, the outward manifestation of what in my mind should be a conversation. Right. So when I've been asked to share my story, usually it's, oh, also sign this consent form. And I go, uh, okay, but what, what am I signing? Especially for video, how long am I giving you my consent to use video? 
Because again, right, if, if a video is out there online, and this happened to a client of mine, somebody could see a video that's five or six years old. The person in the video at the time could have been incredibly excited to share that story six years ago. They no longer identify with that story. But if someone comes across it today, in their mind, that story is present. And so if they go up to the person whose story it was, and this is the situation that happened, and say like, you know what? I saw that video of you on that organization's website and it was so moving. I, I didn't know you'd gone through that. Mm-hmm. Suddenly the storytellers re-traumatized, right? And put back in that place. Mm-hmm. And so part of that consent conversation is very much, hey, here are the implications of this. We wanna make sure that you um, remain in control of your story at all times. So we're going to be using video. It's going to be on these platforms. And after six months, we're going to get in touch with you and ask if you still consent, right? So mm-hmm. like that conversation to me is more important than the document itself, right? Um, the other thing I'd share, I'm just looking at the question. The The children thing, uh, Diana, I might... I might defer to you on this. I don't have too much um, experience with it because I generally uh, caution people to stay away from telling stories about children that are not about how awesome the children are, right? (laughs) Mm. So the idea is if this kid were to come across this story in 10 years, would they feel good about it? And if the answer is anything but yes, don't tell the story, Mm -hmm. right? Because like you said, like social media, the, the... this stuff isn't going anywhere anymore, right? It's out there and it's findable. And so being really conscious of the the forward-looking ripple effects on the folks who are brave enough and like generous enough to share their stories. So for me, I like to take it back to where I started with ethical stories telling, where I started with my education on it. And that was Um, an article that was published by Save the Children called The Practicalities of Informed Consent and Development Photography. So homework for you all. Um, But one of the things that it says in there is that informed consent is a process, not a form, and being informed takes priority over getting consent. So here's how I used to use forms. I would have a form that was based off of what I was going to publish. If I knew that I was going to publish somebody's first name, last name, city location, um, the the name of the program they were in, what city they lived in, uh, maybe they had kids. Maybe I was going to publish the kid's first name. Maybe I was going to publish, you know, X, Y, Z. The form was long, but it was based off of what I knew in my organization, what we had determined was the best practice for what we were going to publish. And I think that's the informing piece of getting consent. You have to know what you're going to be putting out there for how long you're going to be putting it out there so that you can actually inform your clients and give them all of the information up front and ask them, is it all right if I publish your your last name? Is it all right if I publish your the city that you're from? Because if you're not asking all of those details and you put them out there, it was like it's like Michael was saying, once something's out there, it's out there. You really can't take it back, you know? Um, and so that that's really what it comes to when it's um, when it comes to forms. Um, and then then the other part of the question is how, how can we ensure our agreements inform and protect everyone involved? That's how you do it. You go through everything that you're going to publish line by line. And then on the back end, and this is what I take folks through um, in the informed consent conversations framework that I talk about is um, pass back the mic. Whatever you're going to publish about someone, give it to them, show it to them before you actually hit that publish button so that they can tell you whether or not they are happy with it. Because I would always tell my clients, like my number one goal for you is that you are proud of the transformation that you've made, that I am representing you how you want to be represented. Because again, this story is going to live probably on the internet forever. And even if you take social media posts down, even if you, you know, take videos down, somebody shared it and you just can't control that. Once it's out there, it's out of your control in a lot of ways. Um, And the other thing is too, to make sure that that client always knows who to get in touch with if they want to have a story taken down. Because like Michael was saying, like I used to work with a lot of youth. So let's say I published this story about 
some adversities that they went through. And then now they're on LinkedIn, they're trying to find a job, right? They might not want prospective employers to find that story about them because it's not about that anymore, right? It's a piece of the puzzle of their lives, but it doesn't have to be the determining factor and it shouldn't be the determining factor in whether or not they get hired. Um, and as for um, what special considerations do we need to take for children? Um, <laughs> I love this this premise of, if it's not positive, just, just don't put it out there. But also with kids, um, again, because I used to work with youth who were young parents, um, we would mention the kids um, and we would talk about them only in terms of what's oh, yeah, going on with the parents. And so like, let's say, you know, one of the stories was like, you know, this young woman is graduating high school and her, she just managed to get her kid to drop her pacifier, you know, like that's a huge win <laughs> on the parenthood front. So it's, you know, well-rounded stories and it wasn't really about the kid, but for organizations that are serving children, this consent, this informed consent process needs to be followed through with their parent or with their guardian. Right. And even though they probably signed in their intake form, some media release clause that says, yeah, you have permission to use my pictures, my stories, my X, Y, Z forever, however you want, you know, as, as nonprofits, we have a responsibility to go beyond that media release clause and to actually tell folks what it is that's involved when we share their stories. Thank you. That's fantastic. Any other, any other, um, any other points to add? I just wanna quickly add that we need to make sure that our consent forms or conversations are language and culturally appropriate. So if your lawyer drafted something that no one's really gonna understand, let's make sure that we're putting in the effort that people who are signing or agreeing understand what they're signing and agreeing to. Would you all recommend keeping like a digital record of it? Um, you know, taking a picture of it or something and uploading it to a, so you have it, you know, <laughs> so it doesn't get lost in the, in all your paperwork. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because the thing is, it's like, none of us is going to stay at an organization forever, right? We right. have to be able to pass on that knowledge because I mean, you might be there for a year, two years, somebody's going to come after you. So how are they going to know about, you know, what that client's preferences were? And so a lot of people ask about, you know, timelines, how long should I publish something? Well, that's up to your organization to decide. And whether that's six months or a year or two years, communicate that with your client. How long is it going to be out there? Right. Because people come back to stories that, you know, they had from like, you know, their first year of foundation and, you know, they're like 10, 15 years in as an organization. And, you know, it's very different for that person now. So, you know, having a, a timeline for how long to use a story is really important too. Not a simple task, but um, but uh, no, thank you for that. Um, Di Diana, we're gonna come back to you on this one. This one is from Lindsay. Um, what is the best way to approach interviewing beneficiaries while respecting their boundaries? How do you craft useful but mindful questions? A little bit of tactical questions right here. Um, yeah, I love this question. So. Going back to what I said earlier is, you know, the direct service staff were my best friends. You know, my my roles, communications and marketing development. I was not a direct service staff, but we would talk in depth about a potential client, about a potential client's story. How ready were they? What were they grow, going through at the time? My favorite question to ask them was, are there any topics that I should stay away from when I interview this person? Great. Right. Because while they may be, you know, over here on mile 10 in one area of their lives, they may be at the starting line in another, you know, they may be going through something and we don't want to bring that up or bring it into the story if it doesn't need to be. So I would make sure to ask what questions, what type of questions should I, should I avoid, right? Because we don't want to give somebody, you know, take away the opportunity for somebody to tell their story um, just because they have something else going on. If they're ready in one way, but not another, that's fine. And I mean, each of us have pieces of stories that we want to share and that we're ready to share. So, you know, talking to, to the direct service staff was um, key for me. It was essential. Like I wouldn't start any kind of story about anyone without talking to their direct service staff first. Yeah, I mean, did you find that that, that served as a good anchor to make sure that you're being ethical, to make sure that, because they're probably advocating on that person's behalf. Exactly. Um, 
you know, to have someone fill that role as an advocate for that storyteller that's not the marketer. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, that goes to ethical storytelling, I believe, should be a best practice at every organization. And if it is a best practice, then there's process involved. And part of that process was to have that connection between the publisher, which was me in that marketing communications role, and the advocate, right, the direct service staff for that client. And then finally, to bring in the client and have them participate at every level up until the time of, of publishing of like what was or wasn't going to be said about them. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, great. Um, question number five. This one is for Calliope on from Aaron. And of course, anyone else can chime in as well. What are your thoughts on paying people either dollars or gift cards for sharing their stories? Do you think there's an ethical dilemma associated associated with payment? Yeah, you know, the, the fact that it's kind of worded as an ethical dilemma sort of implies that there's two opposing schools of thought. Um, and I think it's worth um, explaining what those are. For those folks that come from a background in journalism, you'll probably have it drilled into you that you are not supposed to pay sources. It's actually um, unethical in, in journalism and in most journalism associations to pay your sources for information. The idea is that in paying people, um, the stories lose credibility, right? The insight loses credibility because people would come, um, you know, providing this information, you know, incentivized by money, not because it's actually the truth or because it's a worthy story. Um, and, and so, you know, that that's kind of one school of thought. And then on the other hand, we have a different approach that kind of stems from us critically examining practices in the nonprofit sector, where we see broadly a lot of unpaid labor, board members, volunteers, unpaid interns, all the overtime that salaried staff put in that, that isn't compensated. And yes, um, storytellers uh, and uh, people sharing their story, people giving feedback, people giving speeches and not being paid. So our sector as a whole has a lot of relies a lot on unpaid labor and we're asking ourselves these questions of is this reliance on unpaid labor right is it fair is it sustainable um and so the question around paying storytellers i, I think really sits in the context of this broader discussion around um these practices in our sector in general um i advise to pay people when there's a significant contribution of time on the part of the storyteller. Some of these interviews take 45 minutes, one hour. That's a pretty significant amount of time. Um, and certainly I really, really encourage folks to pay people when they're being asked to share their story like in person or on Zoom, right? In real time, because that is such a huge emotional labor, whether it's happening on Zoom, whether it's happening definitely on a stage at your event. Um, even in a small group, like let's say you're bringing um, donors or funders around for a, like a site visit and you want uh, someone to come in and share their story with that small group of folks, um, you know, when you when you look at that, everyone is being paid, but the storyteller, right? Your staff are being paid. They're working, right? The, the foundations, you know, program officers are being paid, yeah. doing their job. Yeah. But then the storyteller is not being paid, you know, and we have to ask ourselves, is that really fair? And so for sure, asking someone to share their story in real time, I would pay them. It's so much preparation. It's so much work. It's so much emotional labor. Um, and if it's a big time commitment, you know, I, I, I would whether, you know, in terms of the specifics, what's the amount? Should it be cash? Should it be a gift card? You know, it really depends on the context. I, I don't want to give a blanket answer because it depends on who you're working with, <laughs> um, you know, what the culture is, uh, how you're situated within that community. You know, and so uh, this is a question I would even bring back to some of your storytellers or, you know, people, your clients, right? I, I would say, hey, we're exploring um, offering a stipend for stories. We're thinking about this amount. We're thinking about this method. What do you think? Uh, I would bring it back to them and get and get information from the source uh, is what I would do. I don't know if folks have other things they want to add. Um, I love that answer. I love bringing in the context of where this started in journalism and why people might feel a little gross about paying people for their stories. Um, but I agree with everything that, that you've said. And I would also add that even with compensating story owners, they still have abundant agency to choose what part of their stories they're going to tell, to decide once it's out in the open that they want it removed. We can do both. We can compensate and still allow for a lot of control and agency for for those who are briefly telling their stories. Do you guys think that that maybe muddies the water sometimes a little bit? That would be the only thing I could think of is it's that not now it becomes transactional. 
Right. Well, and then you people... don't want that. Yeah, I mean, I, I might draw the distinction between paying people for their stories and compensating them for their time. Mm. Right. Oh, that's a great Once you pay it. for the story, that's transactional. Because now if I'm like, hey, um, Maria, can I pay you for this story? There's an expectation that that story is going to fit something I have in my mind. Yeah. But if I say, I'd love to uh, compensate you for the time and like, and like, we were saying, you know, the emotional labor of like going through this, right? Like this is this is a, a contribution, then that's relational, right? And we it, it doesn't really muddy the waters as much. And so that languaging is actually really, and even the mindset is really, really important. Yeah, I definitely agree with, with that. Um, there's definitely two schools of thought, like Calliope was saying, um, you know, are you paying someone? And, and that's the reason why they are sharing their story because they want to be paid or are you compensating, you know, someone for their time? And the way that I like to think of it is if I'm going to have an event and I'm paying a keynote speaker to be there, why wouldn't I pay the client who is sharing their story, who is without the title, also a keynote speaker, right? Mm -hmm. So compensating them from their, for their time is only fair. Well, and think of it in terms of brand ambassadors. I mean, in a sense, they're almost a brand ambassador to exactly. your programs. Yes. And 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 certainly on the for-profit side, those people are getting paid. Yeah. <laughs> they're getting well, paid very to... well. So it's almost unethical to not pay them in a certain yeah. sense. I used to run an ambassador program, right? These were volunteer clients from the organization that would be invited to speak at donor events and would be invited to speak um, or share their stories online or create videos and do stuff like that. And they would be compensated. You know, it was almost like an internship type of thing. That's fascinating. That is a question that I think about a lot. Um, all right. So let's see, moving on. Um, unless anything else to share on that one, that's a pretty deep, rich question. I feel like we could spend a lot of time on that. Um, this next one is from Michael and is from, I, I want to make sure, Tovi, I believe. Um how do you decide when an anonymous story with stock photography is worthwhile, appropriate, and ethical versus insisting on identifying customers with their consent and using their actual images? Very interesting. I mean, that's such a context-dependent question. I mean, I mean one, I would, never, I would never use the word insist when we're talking about using people's pictures. Yeah. Like, that's just not, that, that, that's a big no-no in my mind. Um, to use a sophisticated term. No, no. Um, so here, here's what I'd say. One, uh, I want to put this in the context of where we are with AI, which is the assumption within the next year is that every organization is going to be using AI to generate images and it's terrible, which means we're in this place where there's going to be a tremendous degradation of trust. Um, mm -hmm. So what I'd say is like, if you're going to use stock images, great let your readers or your viewers know that these are stock images and that they've been purchased from stock photo or made with mid journey, whatever, right. To make that trust um, at the center. The other thing I'd say is like, if there's any chance that your, your people, your storytellers could come to any kind of harm, if their image or name gets out there, then we use some other way. It can be a piece of art. It can be, it doesn't have to be stock photos, right? There's other visuals that we can use. And the example I'd use for that is I, I did some work with a beautiful organization that promoted literacy uh, for women in Afghanistan, which is illegal, right? And so they were really dealing with, they couldn't tell any specific stories because even the smallest detail could put these women in danger. And so we really looked at, well, what kind of images um, that are consistent with asset framing could we use on social media to get eyeballs? Well, it's literacy. So we use books, right? We use hands. We right. There's lots of things that we can do that are mm -hmm. a little bit more imaginative, creative, and interesting than just saying, oh, I'm going to find a stock photo of somebody who looks like... Um, Calliope or somebody who looks like Maria, because like that's kind of right. That's the right demographic. So so that's what I'd say. It's it's kind of it's a really nuanced thing that also goes to what what's the intention of your story, right? What kind of visual will help support that story and build the community around your mission? Um, yeah. So for context, I also used to work with young people uh, who were, you know, experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. 
And one of the first changes we made is like, they were notorious for using stock photos of like, you know, sad children looking hungry in a sleeping bag. It was black and white. We're yeah. like, but this isn't our young people. This isn't what these young people are. Why are we using those photos? Well, it was because a consultant told them to, right? Because that's what was best practice. I mean, thankfully that's starting to shift. Yeah, Maria, I love that. Um, hands, silhouettes, backs, like there's so many images that can be really compelling um, without resorting to stock photos that you might see on three other agencies' websites, right? Anybody else have anything to add to that one? I think that's a pretty rich one, especially you mentioned AI. We could do a whole day on that too. I, actually, yeah, um, I wanted to say about the AI. I recently came across an article that was talking about the use of AI images to depict the Israel-Palestine conflict um and so my my litmus test is like what is the intention behind using either an ai generated image or a stock photo because essentially it's not real it's not actually representative right so what's the intention behind it what is that photo adding to the conversation that whoever the storyteller is can't add it in a different way um you know there's all of these questions and then um Michael mentioned, you know, telling people that their their photography has been purchased or that it's been AI generated, you know, telling your supporters why you're doing that. If it's safety reasons, it's educating them about that, you know, and it's something that you can't just say once. You have to say it over and over and over and over again, because while we're all involved in this nonprofit space and ethical storytelling and all of these things, supporters of nonprofits are, this isn't their bread and butter. This isn't what they're doing every day. So we have to repeat the message constantly in order for them to start to understand why we might do things the way that we do. Yeah. Yeah, though this will be this will be something we talk about next year if we do this again, because I think it's only going to get more complex um as ai expands all right this question is for everybody we'll start with maria um this question is a challenging one but has come up uh time and time again let's discuss what some refer to as and i'll say it poverty porn um where you see someone's desperation being exploited for the sake of raising funds for the cause how can nonprofits be sure they're avoiding this type of exploitation? And how do you recommend standing up to stakeholders who might request these types mm. of stories? I think that last part is very interesting. Yeah. I always think of um, Sally Struthers and the Save the Children commercials back in the 80s and 90s and the amount of money that they raised. And unfortunately, poverty porn does work for fundraising. And fortunately, we are moving in the direction uh, of telling stories more ethically and with dignity. And I say, as a lens, if you can try to tell a story that evokes empathy instead of saviorism, so this could be you, this could be your uncle, this could be your neighbor. And that's a practice, right? I mean, that takes time. Um, but again, as a storytelling lens and practice, um, also, I think it's very key, and all of us have, have talked about this in one way or another, pain exists and we don't want to skirt around the pain that the people we serve have experienced, but we have choices on how much of that story we're going to focus on the pain, how much of the details we're going to focus on versus how much of that story we're going to focus on the transformation and the bright future that is ahead of them, right? Um, so that's something that I that I often talk about is let's focus on let's give people agency over their stories and let's talk about their transformation um, and focus on the transformation. Um, I think it was Calliope that mentioned context, like let's not just make it about this one person and the decisions that they've made, but there are greater socioeconomic and cultural, racial, all kinds of things that are going on that have that lead to this story. Um, and to answer, how do we lead up for these kinds of conversations? And I say, you know, you have um, four people here that are that are really trying to pave the way in this. And we all do like trainings and, and teachings. And so like instead of um, I, I will say throw us under the bus and, and tell, you know, bring bring this recording to them 
or say, hey, for the next board retreat or for the next staff retreat, I think it would be great to have. And I'm not just doing this to pitch my services, but I really think that, that, that when I give retreats for boards and for leadership, I know that having a trauma-informed organization is top down. It really is. It's not something you can do in a silo. It's not something that the marketing director can decide or the fundraising director can decide. It's something that as a whole, an organization needs to decide. And I think that's going to come with training and with, um, you know, in, in investing, leaders investing in, in, in this kind of worldview shift. So I, I, I just give so much grace and empathy to those who have frustrations in their role that they, they feel like they're um, being pushed to tell stories that doesn't feel good to them. And I think all of us here, and I, Diana and I have spoke about how we've been in that role working in house. Um, and, you know, let's just take one step forward every day in trying to um, shift how we are telling stories. Mm -hmm. I think for me, um, we have to be looking at the way I define ethical storytelling is telling the story the way that the storyteller wants it told. It's not the way we want it told. It's not how, how would I tell my story? You know, what, what, what if it was me? It's not about me. It's not about what another organization is doing. It's about how our storytellers, the people who are experiencing the impact of our missions, want their stories told. And if we're telling them in that way and we're in integrity with them, um, then it's not exploitative because we're honoring their own desires for how they want their story to be um to be out there um you know I, I think that like poverty porn that term you know it, it has this element of voyeurism right um mm -hmm. which I, I think is is really different and um you know like maria kind of how you said it works i think there's been a lot of studies because you know poverty porn um gives a feeling of guilt you feel guilty that you're seeing you know someone so disadvantaged and that you want to give but I want to remind folks here, because I'm looking at fundraising more holistically, it only works in like mass market acquisition. That's where the research studies have been in let's send out a blast to all these people who've never given before and see who gives for the first time. I come from major gifts. We don't use guilt to inspire donors to make a million dollar gift. We don't use guilt in those conversations, right? And so um, look more broadly at the kinds of stories that you know, your organization is telling, if you've raised even one major gift, you've probably used an inspiring story. Um, and those, that, those are inspiration that you can draw from, you know, don't just read the studies that are focusing on mass market acquisition. Um, it's so much more holistic than that. It's a beautiful distinction. I, I appreciate that you shared that. I'd, I'd um, like to add, just because I'm seeing in the chat from Pamela, it, it often takes on a racialized component as well, which is which is really, really true. And it's it's worth when I've worked with people who resist kind of ethical storytelling, usually it's because they're like, well, the best practice is X. We do it this way. And it's worth understanding the context within which that exploitative storytelling evolved, which is philanthropy was never intended to create systems change. It just wasn't. Originally, philanthropy was intended for wealthy people to give tax-free gifts to make sure that people with less still had less but felt better about it. That And that, that comes from a lot of different sources, right? So we're talking about systems change, right? And so one, and when I tell people that sometimes they go like, oh, and I'm like, yeah. So it's not just unethical. You're actually perpetuating systems of oppression with these stories. And they go, oh, God, how can I do it differently? Usually, sometimes they go like, I don't care. Um, it's also worth saying that uh, there is, it, until last year, this past year, there wasn't really a study that showed how effective participant-led storytelling is in fundraising. Now there is. Um, in a study, it was done in international aid. Participant-led storytelling was shown to be 35% more effective than traditional a traditionally designed fundraising campaign, right? So there is kind of like a mounting data. Yes, Frank, D, I'm just looking at the chat. That that comes from Decolonizing Wealth, right, by Edgar Villanueva, where he talks about using money as medicine. In my mind, ethical storytelling is using story as medicine, right? It's not just doing no harm. It's, it's healing. How can we work with story, even fundraising stories, to facilitate healing in our organizations, in our sector, and in our communities, right? No big deal. Just little, little things. Oh, hey, you're, you're, you're just talking my language now. Yeah. And if we think about it that way, uh, to Michael's point, it's like, well, if we're thinking about it from that perspective of decolonizing wealth, then why not compensate our storytellers mm -hmm. for their time, right? 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, consider also the mediums that these things are shared, not so much email or in person, but social media platforms. I mean, they're designed to be exploited. That's the whole reason they, you know, that's what makes them work. So um, you got to get those likes, right? Um, okay, great. All right. Well, let's go on to the next question. We are 355 is Eastern time is when we were going to kind of do our last question. Um, so we have a little more time. Um, all right. So Diana, this is for you and of course others to contribute as well. This is from Monica. Is it important to consider that every donor will read the story with a preconceived bias? Are there strategies to overcome or address biases while still ensuring the client's experience, experience remains at the forefront of the story? Interesting. So let me tell you what my philosophy is with storytelling. My philosophy is that instead of telling stories about your clients, we need to be telling stories with our clients. And to the, to the biases, we all have biases. <laughs> every client is gonna read something or, or every donor is gonna read something with a bias. We are gonna approach clients for their stories with a bias. We are watching this webinar with a bias. We all show up with biases every single day of our life. So it is important to consider. So I think where I would go with this is what are what story are you subliminally telling in the language that you use to describe the client or to describe the donor's role in the story? Because you hear a lot about uh, donor-centric storytelling, where the donor gets to be the hero of the story. I don't advocate for that. I advocate for the client being the hero of their own story because nobody told that client to show up and say yes and do something they had to do it for themselves, right? We helped them along the way with what they wanted and what they needed, hopefully. Um, so I would say be careful of your language, even in just some of the questions that we've seen here today, using words like disadvantaged population, right? Under-resourced children. I think it was Calliope who was talking about assets and deficits-based language. If we're already putting that label on someone, then we're already telling the donor, this is, how, you know, your bias is fine because we're reinforcing it with this type of language, right? So you have to re look really critically at what you're saying, how you're describing people, how you're describing your mission um, so that you can essentially fight against those biases that are not helpful to anyone. They're not helpful to the donor because they're keeping them in the dark. They're not helpful to the client because it's it's you know sticking them in in one little box, right? And they're not helping us move our missions forward either. I love what you said about about versus with. We talk tell stories with our clients. That's a that's a great way to think about it. Anybody else at all on this topic? I would love to touch on donor centric um, stories. I think traditionally yeah, tell do donor stories where it's actually the the client stories, but then the donors' funds help to transform their life. But I think we forget that donors have their own story and their own journey and their own transformation in the context of your organization. And I have journeys where I um, watched a film and I learned about something I never knew before. And then I became a lifelong advocate for that cause, I, a monthly donor. That's my journey. And it's a, it's a beautiful journey that I'm grateful for. Um, think about donors who have the opportunity to be a role model for the role model for their children, how they can teach their children to give back, how they are able to, um, and if you have um, donors who maybe are retirees, how you're giving them an opportunity to, to mentor or to leave a legacy. Um, so I think we can still honor donors through stories as long as the story, they're the hero of their own story, not the hero of somebody else's story. I want to kind of add to that and, and put a slightly different lens on it, which is um, if we know, right, that our audience has a certain preconceived notion about our work, about the people we work with, whatever, there's a couple of ways to shift that. One is to say like, hey, you're wrong. What a jerk. Um, do better. Our people are amazing. The other is to tell, and this comes from uh, Annette Simmons, who's kind of like one of the the godparents of modern organizational storytelling. Uh, she has a book called The Story Factor. She talks about something called an I know what you're thinking story. 
where you have your storyteller, instead of telling a client story, you could have a volunteer tell a story about how their mindset shifted through interaction with your organization, knowing that your readers or listeners or whatever have that same preconceived notion. And so instead of telling them they're wrong or trying to convince them, you simply present them with somebody just like them who went on a learning journey or a journey of transformation, and it opens up a doorway to shift, right? And curiosity for connection, which is really all we're trying to do. We're just trying to build connections and build community. So that's that's another way to work with it, right? If we know for sure, like when I worked with young people um, experiencing homelessness, in Los Angeles, we knew that the preconceived notion was these kids are gangbangers, they use drugs, they're um, you know engaged in sex work. Sometimes that was true, but also they were wildly creative, like incredibly powerful, brilliant young people. So we would have volunteers share their stories about their bias shifting. And every time we'd get feedback, we're like, huh, I never thought of it that way. Can I come for a tour? Which is all we wanted. Right. So it's another another way of working with that. That's phenomenal. That's very phenomenal. Kelly, have anything to join anything to add to that? No, I, I just really Otherwise agree we'll with what everyone's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The next question is for you then. I I Rocio R O C I O. I should have asked beforehand. I, I don't I I apologize for not being able to pronounce your name, but your question is fantastic. Um we want to kind of expand a little bit um, on that on that preconceived bias. So, how do you prevent checklisting this work as DEI versus taking it one step further and committing to these principles to how all communications should be done? So, how to actually make it part of your organization rather than just like, oh, we are committed to DEI. Here's the boxes we checked. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a couple layers to the, this question, and I get a version of it that's more like I. It's really important, but I'm not sure my boss does or leadership does. How do I get their buy-in so that we can roll this out organization-wide? The way that this question is framed um, is hard for me to answer because there, there seems like maybe in this organization, there's an assumption that like DEI work is sort of narrow or siloed or on the side of like, you know, adjacent to the mission, but not integral to the mission. And I actually view DEI work as being integral to um to our sector's very existence and to the work of, of every nonprofit um, here. And so I can't answer the question from the standpoint of here's how to make sure ethical storytelling doesn't get lumped under DEI. I actually think it's very much a part of DEI, um, but I also think DEI is very much a part of a nonprofit's mission. And I think there's kind of an interesting parallel, which is that, you know, some people think that DEI work is really just about not offending people. We have these rules and these policies because we just don't want to offend anyone. But actually it's a very like, not offending people is good, but it's kind of the bare minimum. <laughs> it's like the baseline. And really um, I view DEI work as us in our organizations creating a microcosm for the world that we want to see. There's so much we can't affect outside of, there's so much we can't control or affect outside of um, in, the, in the great world. But, you know, as decision makers in an organization, we can create a microcosm. We can influence that and, cre and create in a small way the world that we want to see, the future that we want to see. Um, and so ethical storytelling, it's the same way. If we're leading with, we just want to do no harm. We just, we want to make sure we're not harming our storytellers. That's good, but it's also the baseline. It's the bare minimum. It's the least we're doing. It's not an inspiring vision. Um, ethical storytelling is actually also about creating the world that we want to see. Um, like Michael mentioned earlier, our stories have the power to perpetuate the systems of inequity that are actually necessitating our work and, and making our work more difficult. They have the power to undo those systems as well. We can actually change beliefs and behaviors um, of our audience, you know, of, uh, you know, of large populations through our stories. And so it's really about creating the future we want to see. That is the grand vision. That is like the potential of ethical storytelling. Um, and then practically to come back to that question of, you know, how do I influence others in my organization to roll this out? Find those people that are aligned with you. It's really hard to do this alone. Um, find the folks that agree with you and start with small changes, but lead with that big vision, right? Keep the big vision in mind, um, but start with small changes and find who your allies are and grow that network over time. Um, and I'd love to hear from others kind of yeah. what your advice is as well. Yeah, Kelly, I'm right there with you. Um, 
So ethical storytelling, I think we would all agree is the best practice, but the only way for it to survive any of us in any organization is to make it an SOP, standard operating procedure. These are the steps that you take to ensure that your stories are as ethical as they can possibly be. Step number one, what are you publishing? Step number two, have you talked to the direct service staff about their client and what not to ask? Step number three, you've involved the client, you've informed them as to everything that they need to be doing, or I'm sorry, everything that you're going to be publishing and, and have gotten the permission to, as granular as it's okay to post on Facebook, but it's not okay to post on LinkedIn. Um, and then did you review that, that piece that you came up with, whether it's a video story, whatever, with the client? Did they give you approval? Did you ask them, is there anything that you want to add, edit, or delete, right? These are the steps to follow. And did you give them that contact information about how they were going to, um, you know, contact someone if they wanted that story taken down or retracted or changed or whatever, right? There is a process to follow. And that's what I talk about in informed consent conversations. It's a best practice. It's a, it's a standard operating procedure and it's doable. And what you said, Calliope, about um, getting your allies together, that's where you start. Because oftentimes it's, you know, like middle managers that are like, oh yes, you know, this is really important or your direct service staff, this is important. And they're pushing back on something that you're doing with development or communications because they're seeing that it's having a, an adverse effect on their clients. So take that, there's your allies right there, right? Form a committee, you know, present your findings to your leadership and then have your leadership, you know, schedule some time with you uh, for you at the next board meeting to present your findings and why you should make this the best practice. Once people understand the why behind why you need to stop tell stories ethically, it's really hard to say no, right? It's, it's really hard to say no. Then you just work through the actual, you know, like implementing it so that no matter where we all go in the future, that's still there. That's a legacy that you left behind at that organization. Right. I mean, well, there uh, is a business outcome. Like you're going to make more money. You're going to, your content's yeah. going to be better. A, a couple of, a couple of thoughts. One, like in addition to the operating procedures, like create an actual double bottom line for your storytelling. In other words, and that That's double great. bottom line might be, does this adhere to the principles of dignified storytelling, which are at dignifiedstorytelling.com, right? You don't need to make any of this up over the past five years. Other people have done this for you all over the world. Right. The other thing I'd say is like, if you're not telling stories internally as an organization and honoring each other's stories internally, the likelihood that you're going to be able to do it with your clients is almost nil. It's not going to be sustainable because you don't know if I don't know what it is to share my story and feel how vulnerable that is, right? Even a story about something great is vulnerable. Um, then it's going to be really, really difficult for me to honor the stories of others. And so when we talk about building a culture of storytelling, that's part of ethical storytelling, because otherwise it gets siloed off into development and communications. And that's where we get to that, that checkbox type situation. Marie, anything to add? Otherwise we'll go to the last question and we'll finish, we'll, we'll finish up. You can go ahead to the last okay, question. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Last question is a nice one, some practical advice for people. Of course, I have like 20 windows open. Um, all right. So this is for everybody. Um, what organizations have you seen do, quote, no harm storytelling, unquote, um, really well? And where should we look for good examples that we can use? Um, I want to say I'll that, this, that is a, yeah, well, this is a journey, not a destination. So I don't know anyone who's doing it perfectly. But I think, uh, and I put a few links of, of organizations, I think, that are really making strides on this. Sanctuary for Families in New York, who works in um, domestic violence, gender-based violence, are doing really wonderful jobs. Um, Emerge Lanka, I think, and I put their website in there too, in, as far as images, are doing a really fantastic job of using images that are ethical and trauma-informed. And Thistle Farms, which works with women who have formerly been trafficked, um, oh my goodness, talking about processes and procedures, they have set so many processes and procedures in place to protect um, the women they serve, specifically for storytelling. I could talk about it forever, but I will say there are organizations out there that are doing it. I'll, I'll add to that list. For folks who are interested in like 
what it looks like to own how terrible your storytelling has been and uh, want to shift it. Doctors Without Borders has a great anti-race. They've got issues internally, but they have a really well done video that says, hey, we've been doing a terrible job. Here's the harm we've caused. We're committing to doing better and here's how. So if you just look up Doctors Without Borders anti-racism, that pops up. Um, freefrom.org in Los Angeles is a tremendous organization that not only tells incredibly ethical stories, but also has um, uh, decolonizing wealth built into their organizational DNA, such that their starting salary is $85,000, starting for anybody in the organization. Uh, Myfriendsplace.org, where I used to work, does a beautiful job of this. Um, and then there's an amazing organization in Tanzania called Thai that does community-based um, animated films. Uh, about really mm. deep systemic issues in their communities. So, and that's a really creative approach to participatory storytelling. I love that. I would also add that the organization I used to work with, uh, Shine Together, we took this thing from like that concept of, oh, we really need to do things better. And it started because uh, I published a story about someone who'd been in a domestic violence situation and I had published her photos out there. Everything was out there about her. And at that point I realized, oh, there has to be a better way to do this. So we formed a committee and we we went through the entire process and it takes a really long time. And to Maria's point earlier, none of us is perfect in this. Not one of us, no organization is perfect. If you, if you dig under the surface, we all make mistakes. The point is that we have to recognize them, right? And do better, put, put the systems in place so that we can prevent those uh, mishaps in the future, those mistakes in the future. I hope anything anything to add? No, I think this was was just great. I'm reading all through right. all comments in the chat. That's, that's really this has really been excellent. That that'll be our last question for today. This will definitely be a continuing conversation. Um, I definitely want to thank everyone who attended and submitted questions. Our panelists. What a really, really nice event. Um, like I said, we're going to be continuing to dive deep into this subject over 2024. And Carly's going to put together an ebook um, that has a lot of the insights from both um, from you guys, but also from attendees. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all very much for your time. For those who want to hang out, I'm going to give a quick demo of Memory Fox. I think it can help with your ethical storytelling, but, but, uh, but you know, feel, feel free to hop off. Um, but Thanks thank everybody. you all yeah, so much awesome. for your time and thank you all for thank what you. you do. Yeah. Cool. All right. Real quick, I'm just going to show everybody how Memory Fox works. Um, it is a really cool platform. A lot of work went into it to help with your storytelling needs. So if I can get this going, of course, webinar, there we go. All right. So just real quick at a high level, Memory Fox is a DIY software that helps you collect stories from your community, keep them all organized in one place, and design that content into all kinds of cool, amazing ways, either using our video editor, story presentation tools, or our Canva integration. Um, everyone hopefully loves Canva. We definitely love Canva. It's amazing and it's free. So if you don't have it, I definitely recommend checking out. It will definitely help with your storytelling needs in terms of how to package the content and then get it out into the world. Um, so Memory Fox is an end-to-end -end storytelling solution that streamlines the entire storytelling process for you from collection to consent, to keeping it all organized, to designing it and then getting it out into the world to help you fundraise. So. Um, thank you so much for your time. Carly's going to drop a link. Oh, she already dropped the link in the chat where you can learn more and schedule a session with one of our team members. Um, but feel free to reach out to me directly at any time. My email address is chris at memoryfox.io. And I look forward to hearing from you all and continuing this conversation moving forward. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for what you do and have a great day.